Good morning. Good morning. For those of you that don't know me, I am Mike Robertson. And what I want to do real quick is just uh, do some announcements and then we'll get to the worship. Uh, Tuesday night, a women's Bible study will start in three weeks. I held up the right number of fingers. Sometimes I want to do four. Uh, we Saved You a Seat is the name of the book. And it's by uh, smaller handwriting. <laughs> Lisa Joe Baker, uh, see Pam Horton. Pam, stand up just for a second. If you're interested in the book and interested in doing the study, see Pam and she'll help you. We, we just need to purchase some books. Um, first steps, October 18th from 3 to 4.30 here in the church. First steps is an opportunity for you to get to know the pastor and his wife a little better and also to learn more about the church itself. So if you're interested, there is a sign-up sheet out back on the bulletin board. <clears throat> also, Calvary Chapel Magazine. We have a magazine, which is pretty cool. It has a lot of things that shows what Calvary Chapel as an organization, if you will, as a group of churches is doing around the world, not just in the country. The other thing that I love about it is on the back, it has the gospel message. So if you take it, read it, leave it somewhere, share it, someone may pick it up, they may read this, and it may change their life. For eternity so that's the thing I love the most on here obviously on the inside some really cool stuff but on that <clears throat> also the food bank has issued a greatest needs list uh, thank you Pam Horton for keeping us informed on that that is on the bulletin board as well if you have a desire to be involved in bringing in food uh, there's a list back there look at the list it'll tell you what we need what they need and Obviously, I'm going to have to turn the air on because a lot of people are fanning. So, um, and I'm hot too, so it's not just y'all. So, uh, you can see Pam Horton about that as well. Today's Pam Horton Day. Um, we can see Pam, and Pam can uh, help you with, you know, what's needed. You can give it to her. She's collecting it. Um, and as a note that Pam brought up, which I thought was beautiful, if there's anyone in the church that needs food, needs help, please, 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 I can't say it enough. See Pastor David, see myself, see someone else. I don't care who you talk to, but ask for help. We're here to help you guys. You know, it brings us great joy. It's a privilege. It's a blessing to help others. If you know someone who has a need and you want to kind of privately tell us, that's fine as well. We will not approach them. We will not embarrass them. Uh, not that they should be embarrassed, but we won't walk up to them and go, hey, I hear you need something. We're not going to do that, but we'll be aware of it. We'll be praying about it. We'll be on the lookout for it. And if the time comes up where maybe it's just the right time to talk about it, we'll talk about it. But typically we won't. The Lord will open their heart if they desire need, if they need help. Uh, but please ask. We want to be a blessing to you guys. And with that, why don't we pray real quick, and then we will hop straight into worship. Father God, thank you for this morning, Lord. What a blessing it is to be here in your house, Lord, to be amongst brothers and sisters that love you, desire to hear your word, to sing your praises, to be in your presence, Father God. I pray you would just, uh, that your word would be mighty this morning, that the words that you give to our pastor would be your words, that they would be anointed by you, and that when we hear them, Father God, they would speak deeply into our souls. Father, I just thank you for the worship team that is up here, their desire to, uh, to lead us in worship of you, our God, the creator of all things, Father. Lord, just bless this time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Mike. But I do have one thing. I think we need to turn around up here on the stage because Linda's on the wrong side of the church. I feel imbalanced or something here. What are you doing? And if you don't believe me, ask Pam. I understand that's where we go to. We have a problem today, right? How about we all stand and let's just praise the Lord this morning with smiles on our faces.
have so much going on around us. If we look at each other, we have on masks. We've never seen that before in our lives. If you look around, not only in your neighborhoods or in your cities or towns or uh, townships you live in, you just see maybe a neighbor or neighbors or families going through so much turmoil because of the stress that this pandemic may have on you or financially or just within your relationships or whatever the case may be. But you know something? I want to guarantee you 100% that God is still moving. And I also want to say this morning that no matter what you're going through, and you've heard me say this time and time again as a worship leader, He will meet you where you need Him to meet you or where He thinks He needs to meet you, but He will meet you. I don't care how you're dressed. I don't care what your color is. I don't care what your background is. I don't care what you're doing today. He will meet you because he's always on the move. And I was listening a couple of weeks ago. And this song hit me right between the eyes. Some of you may have heard it. Some of you may have not. The guy who wrote it is the worship leader over at uh, or down in Bethel. And just the way that it come about was just like this. He, this, is how, this is how he started. He just sat down with some people and this is what he said. Now just be the Stronghold still being loosed. God, we believe. Yes, we can see. That wonders are still what you do. Bodies are still being raised. Giants are still being slain. God, we believe. Yes, we can see. Wonders are still what you do. We are here.
Good morning, Saints. Good morning. Wow, goodness gracious. Y'all know it's Sunday, right? <laughs> Good morning, Saints. Good morning. We, so we've got a reason to be joyous and happy and excited, don't we? Amen. We do. And you know, sometimes you have to elbow someone and say, yes, you do. But let your face know it. Yes. You know? <laughs> let your face know it. Because we should be all kinds of excited because Jesus is Lord. He is on the throne. No matter what this world can throw at us, <laughs> he's not moving, is he? Amen. Yeah. It's something that we can take just comfort in and knowing. All right, so this morning, gang, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at chapter 11. We're closing it out, the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, starting with verse 17. So if you have your Bibles with you, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting with verse 17. And as you're doing that, a quick recap of where we were last week. If y'all remember from last week, we um, were looking at a couple of different things. Paul was writing to the church about order. He talked about headship, and he talked about a cultural distinctive, which was the head covering. And I told you, this is not preached much from the, the uh, pulpits in churches around here, just around the world. It's, it's a difficult thing for some folks to hear. I don't know why. Because we worship a God of order, not chaos, right? Yes. That's all he was saying, is that the head of Christ is God. The head of man is Jesus. And the head of woman is man. Now, that's not all circumstances. He's specifically speaking about in a, a marriage environment. The man should be the spiritual leader in the family, but also in a positional uh, approach when it comes to the church. Not all men, but those in the position of authority kind of thing. But he also talked about head coverings. And I look and I see that nobody's wearing a bunch of Kentucky Derby hats. <laughs> now, what was really cool is on Tuesday night, the ladies group had their Bible study. And suddenly I get this text at night. And it's a picture of a bunch of the ladies from the Bible study with Tupperware on their head. <laughs> they said, Pastor, we're wearing our masks and we're wearing our hats and so we're covered. It was awesome. But that was a specific cultural thing for that period of time. Um, because at that time, if you remember from last week, I talked about how I met Amy and I saw across the room. Long hair, hair in general, was alluring and provocative for that time. And so there was a covering that women needed to cover with a veil, whatever, not like a jab, but a, a veil to cover their, their heads um, when they were praying and prostituting in the church. So that way people weren't you know, tempted in that way, but also as a sign of submission to their husbands, uh, authority. And again, this doesn't mean less value, less worth, less anything. That's not what it means at all. It's just the order of things. So this morning, we're going to specifically be speaking about the Lord's Supper as Paul continues to talk about order. We're going to talk about order within the Lord's Supper. So let's go to Lord in prayer. Father God, I thank you so much for the order that you've created, Father. I thank you for the people that are here. I thank you for your love, and I pray that our desire is to know you better, to hear your word more clearly. To with courage and faith to apply your truths to our lives. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, looking at verse 17, Paul writes, But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it's not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Okay, so if you remember from last week, I talked about the next few chapters. What Paul is going to be talking about specifically is order. So we've got order in the Lord's Supper. We've got uh, next week spiritual gifts and order within the spiritual gifts. And then you've got the love chapter. And then we get to the resurrection. And so this is where Paul is going. And that's what we're looking at is looking at order. Because we worship a God of order and not chaos. And that's a good thing, right? 
All right, I got a couple amens. All right, so here's the deal. It, imagine not having order in the service. I'm up here preaching, and suddenly Mike comes forward and goes, hey, uh, I think it's time to do the announcements. What? Or uh, y'all are doing the praise, and y'all are, we exalt the Lord, and I come forward and go, all right, everybody, let's take communion. Just interrupting the praise. Or maybe as you come in, and you're getting your communion cups, as soon as you get it, you open it up, and you start partaking instead of taking it together as a family. Order is necessary. Now, here's the, here's the deal. Too much order, and you stifle the spirit. Too little order, and it's chaos. So there's a balance, and sometimes it's a little bit harder to see uh, where that balance is. But what we're seeing this morning is Paul trying to establish order when it comes to partaking of the Lord's Supper. He said, how do you mess up the Lord's Supper? Well, we just read it. What they were doing, they, they managed to find a way to mess it up, and we're going to talk about it a little bit. But full disclosure to everyone this morning, I was reading this text, and it broke my heart. I felt convicted. And y'all know the old saying, right? Misery loves company. So maybe y'all will join me as we begin to unpack this in my misery. But it's a good thing. It's a good conviction. And we're going to camp out here in this text, because what we're looking at is the heart of the struggle um, is the heart of our application this morning. So Paul starts out and says, hey man, I heard that there are divisions and factions among you. That's not hard for us to believe, is it? No, it's not. Divided allegiances and loyalties, we know this to be true because when Paul first started going through this book, what did he talk about? There are factions and divisions among you, right? The factions and divisions we know at that time was we had people that were in their little camps. They had their little cheerleading outfit or the their little uh, sweatshirt with the, the face of their favorite apostle or teacher on it. So some would say, you know, I'm all for Apollos. Apollos, man, that guy is, he's polished. He's such a fantastic speaker. Young guy, he's my guy. And they would listen to Apollos and neglect any other teachers. And the same thing when it came to Cephas or Peter. They'd say, hey, he's my guy, not Apollos. I like Peter because he actually walked with Christ. You know, he got this stuff firsthand. So he knows exactly what happened. And others would say, well, kind of like Paul. May not be much to look at, a little short guy. But, you know, he's the one that started the church. I feel like there's an, a, a loyalty here to that guy. But Paul said, stop it. Stop it. We have one Christ. We all serve one Christ, right? We're all one body. But somehow they managed to make that same mentality come into the Lord's Supper. And again, how in the world do you do that? All right, so listen, it's not hard for us to see, right? How many different ways are there to take the Lord's Supper? Oh, right? You got some folks who say, I like tincture. I like coming forward. I take my bread, I dip it in that cup, and the next person comes and dips it, that kind of thing. Some folks will say, nah, that's not my jam. Here's what I like. I like it when there's a priest that's doing it, and you have to come forward, and you have to kneel down, and you put your hands out, or you open your mouth, and they put it on your tongue. <laughs> I love that. You got, you got some folks that go a different way with it. They say, you know what? Here's what I like. I like coming forward, and I like the idea of unity. So there's just one chalice, and everybody comes. You take the bread, and you sip, and then they turn it, and they wipe it, and then you sip. Mm, that's nasty. Right? No, I, sorry. Didn't mean to say it that loud or out loud. I don't think we're going to be doing that here, but... But you've got other kinds too. You pass out the plate of bread, pass out the plate of the juice, or you, you got the fast food style. I mean, you've got the, what we're using today is you got the bread and the cup all in the same cup, right? It's right there. So there are all lots of different ways to partake of communion, but what we're going to see is Paul's not specifically speaking about the form in which you partake of communion, but the heart of communion. <clears throat> To understand and to comprehend what Paul is talking about, we probably need to look at how the early church participated in communion. The Lord's Supper was an event. It wasn't just the elements. It was, uh, as Jude called it, it was a love feast. Doesn't that sound nice? It was a agape meal. And for some of you, y'all that were raised in the Southern Baptist Church, along with communion was a good old-fashioned potluck dinner. That's what it was. Now, the Jewish folks in the Old Testament, what they would do is they would come together that once a year, and they would celebrate the Passover, and they would have that meal, and they were doing it in remembrance of what the Lord did for them. 
<coughs> excuse me, delivering them from the bondage of slavery in Egypt, right? And what they would do is each family would take a lamb, and they would slaughter that lamb, and they would all eat that lamb at the exact same time. That's really cool. It was like, even though they were in different places, they were all eating it together at the same table. And then you flash forward, and we see the early church, and what they did, they do it once a week. And they would do it in a way not to remember being uh, you know, rescued from Egypt, but in a way to remember rescued from our sins and condemnation and salvation through Jesus Christ and what he went through on that cross. And this is where the conviction was hitting me. Because most churches have gone from an agape meal of remembrance, <coughs> excuse me, when fellowship and unity was a vital part of it, to a fast food mentality of communion. Am I preaching to the choir here? What's happening? <clears throat> Golly. We forget the unity. We forget the remembrance that's supposed to go with. Now, we're doing the remembrance, right? We're doing the remembrance. This I do a remembrance of me. There's nothing wrong with what we're doing, the way that we're doing it. <clears throat> but I think we can do better in bringing in some fellowship. Now, I know that would be hard in this COVID environment, isn't it? Would that be hard? <coughs> Excuse me, I'm trying to get y'all involved. Can I get an amen somewhere? <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like I'm on wheel of fortune. Can I buy an amen? You know? <clears throat> the fellowship and the unity that was part of that early communion is something that we're supposed to do. I got it. Thank you, brother. I had one of those little cough drops. <clears throat> the kind with the menthol stuff. And man, it's killing me. <laughs> My eyes are watering. It's bad. <laughs> anyway, uh, so this is... This is one of the things that was convicting me and looking at, but in a COVID-19 environment, it's hard. It's hard to do to have a potluck dinner. Now, I love a potluck dinner. You can ask Amy. When we first started the church, it wasn't long before I was like, man, I wish we had a church home, a building, so we can have some good old-fashioned potluck meals, right? I love those things. And it wasn't just the meals. It was the, the fellowship and the unity and things like that. I mean, you can ask Amy. We would have these uh, potluck dinners before at other churches and what would end up happening is Amy blushed a little hard she she ended up getting like two plates one for her one for me and by the time I got to that that table it was cold and I didn't mind it at all because I was going from table to table to table talking to people laughing with people getting to know what's going on in their lives praying with them it, it's just beautiful I, I absolutely love it now it's not all about food but if you haven't had Amy's chicken casserole you're missing out if you haven't had Angelina's enchiladas, you're missing out. If you have not had what I hear, Mike's rabbit dishes, you're missing out. So, but can you imagine having that type of meal here in this COVID culture? Oh boy, y'all know what that would look like, don't you? Yeah, you do. You come over there, people line up, there's the line of, of food, and they look over and they go, oh, look at that. That's Georgina's famous apple pie. You know, I'm so looking forward to get a slice of that. But here's the deal. She cleared her throat yesterday. Oh my. And that could be a sign of the Roma. <laughs> you know? And then you keep moving on and then look at that. There's Judy's old-fashioned, homemade, butter-kissed rolls straight out of the oven. You can smell it. And I want one of those. But two days ago, I was talking to Judy. And she told me she was tired. <laughs> that could be a sign of the runner. <laughs> Listen, we, we laugh, but I don't think that's too far off the mark, is it? But I felt convicted when I read the text because I think we can do more to create uh, fellowship opportunities and unity within the church as we're participating in communion. Maybe in our current environment, it doesn't mean a, a potluck meal, but you know, maybe just talking with one another, praying with now, the Corinthian church was doing it right. They had the right form. They were gathering for the agape meal, but what they left out was the agape. They had gone way away from, from the intention of this fellowship meal. They were meeting together, but what was happening was this. You had the haves and the have-nots. The haves were the ones with some money. The have-nots were the ones with not so much money. So the haves would come in, and what they would do is they would bring the good stuff. I mean, fried chicken. We got fried oysters. We got the homemade bread. We got the good wine. They bring all that good stuff. And then you got the have-nots that brought what they could afford. You know, they got the single size of Funyuns. 
You know, they brought the green beans and the, and the, and the beets and stuff like that, and the Kool-Aid. And so all these folks, the haves, were going through, and they were piling up on their plates all this food is absolutely ridiculously tall, and they would leave nothing left for the have-nots. All they had left was pickle beets, mushroom caps, and ginger snaps. <laughs> these folks weren't modestly putting food on their plates until everyone came through. I mean, you'd see these folks with their plates piled so high, it looked like they were Tetris champions, right? They're like, how's that, go to, how's that not falling over? That's impossible. But they did it. They were engineers. And they would come and eat all that food, and they'd leave crumbs for those that came later. So you would have some that came in and ate till they were drunk and sick, and others that left hungry and thirsty. And so Paul had to address that, and he says, what? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Paul tells them, if it's all about food, then go ahead and have your food at home. You, know, you have homes. Go eat your food at your home, and then come back and share in the unity and the fellowship and the communion at the Lord's Supper. But some folks didn't see this, but they had no concern for anyone else. And this is a struggle. And it's a struggle for our culture and our fast-paced, fast-food, uh, get-things-done culture. We're missing the fellowship aspect of our relationships. Can I get an amen? amen. Well, listen, some of y'all know this. When I was growing up, you know what we did every night? At dinner, we came to the kitchen table, and we all ate as a family. <gasps> what? <laughs> there was no TV. There was no TV in that kitchen. There wasn't room for it. But no, there was, there was no TV, and there was no cell phones. You know what we did instead? We would talk to each other. How was your day, honey? What you got going next week or the rest of this week? Or you know, It was just a great time of fellowship. But what's so sad about our culture today is we have so many things. These apps, these things like Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and LinkedIn and all these things that are there to connect us, which are great in and of itself, but what they're doing is they're connecting us with people that are far away, that's not even near us, and what are we doing? We're forsaking those all around us. We're connecting with everyone except those who are physically near us. We're becoming an extremely unsocial and isolated culture, and that bleeds over to the church as well. Uh-huh, yeah, I got some people tucking their toes up right now, don't I? I love that we have Facebook Live. Facebook Live is fantastic because we are reaching people that we would have never reached before. We got people in several different states that are watching these services, which is great. But the problem is when people substitute watching Facebook Live over being part of a local congregation of believers. Ooh, yeah. The same can be said for television preachers. Watch out now, Pastor. Oh, come on. Yeah. Listen, watching Charles Stanley and David Jeremiah and others, that's a good thing. But it doesn't take the place of being part of a local fellowship. Amen. Charles Stanley and David Jeremiah, they are not going to visit you when you're in the hospital. Amen. They're not going to come and have a conversation with you when you're struggling with your relationship with your wife or your kids or your work or whatever. It's great to watch them. Please don't get me wrong. But don't let it take the place of your fellowship at a local congregation. Not to mention, can you use your talents and your gifts at Shadow Mountain or wherever the preacher is that's preaching? Can you use your gifts and talents to help that church over the internet? How do you do that? How do you provide words of encouragement? How do you lay hands and pray with somebody that's online? I can't tell you how many folks I've spoken to that think that watching church at home is just as good as being part of a fellowship. Oh, my. Now, if you have health issues, if you can't make the church because of legitimate reasons, that's fine. But, but here's the deal. We're not called to forsake the assembly of the saints, are we? We're told, don't do that. Don't forsake the fellowship of the saints. It's something that they're never to do. It's creating isolationism and a buffet style of Christianity that looks nothing like what Christ has called us to be. 
Are we tracking? Yeah. All right. I'm going to get some calls and emails about that one. <laughs> now, verse 19, Paul writes something that at first glance may seem strange. He writes, for there may be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. What? All right, so here's the deal. This is a silver lining kind of moment. Look, if we're going to have factions, and I guess we're going to have factions, if we're going to have factions is what he's saying, then let's look at the silver lining. What's the silver lining? Well, when you have those factions, what does it do? When you, have create, when you have struggles or conflict or difficulties within the church, what it does is it creates an opportunity for genuine and authentic Christianity to be seen. Now, what does it also do? It creates opportunity to sow discord. So you've, you've seen it. I'm sure we've all seen it in churches in which you've got some folks, when there's a struggle, when there's a difficulty, when there's a conflict within the church, some of them are just like Pam over there with that little bulletin. They're fanning the flames, right? They're making that thing get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. They're going around gossiping about other people and going out to the community. They're stabbing people in the back. They're trying to push their agenda. All this good stuff. But then you have the peacemakers. Oh, blessed are the peacemakers, right? They're the ones that are sacrificially doing everything they can to help heal the church, to help fix the issue, to not go around talking about it, but hey, let's fix it. Let's do this together. And those are the ones that are displaying genuine, authentic Christian character. And so that's what Paul is saying here. Yeah, we're going to have conflicts, but look at the, if there's going to be a good, let's look at the good in that. We're going to be able to see those folks that are truly, not just lip service, but true Christians. All right, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And we had given thanks, he broke it and said... This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So Paul is going and he's reminding the folks of the words of Christ. To see how far they've come from the original intent and what we're looking at here in this context, as you're going through, you know we do verse by verse. So as we're looking at the content and the context of what we're reading, Paul is not introducing new material to them. He's not. What he's doing is he's reminding them. So he's not trying to dig deep into exactly what the words of Christ meant and, and what he was saying. I mean, there could be sermons upon sermons upon sermons about the sim. The symbolism, the history, the words, the theology behind what he says. But we're going to stay kind of with Paul here. We're just going to, we read the text, and I'm going to say just a couple of things, but we're not going to go deep, deep, deep in these verses. That's for another time. But I do want us to remember a little bit about the context of that night. If you remember, Jesus was not oblivious to the fact that this was, would be his last night before his death. And look what Jesus did. He took all his friends and gathered them around to have a meal with him. Now listen, if it was your last night on the earth, um, would it be about you? It probably would, wouldn't it? We do that with those folks that are going to be executed on death row. What do they get? They get their last meal. They get to pick whatever they want. If it's our last night, you kind of think it'd be about you, right? Hey, this is my last night, guys. It's going to be, we're going to celebrate me. So you would think that Jesus would say, hey, since this is my last meal, Let's go ahead and, and go to Outback. Let's go to uh, Captain George's or Ruth Chris or someplace like that. You know, I really love their food. But instead, he says, you know, I'm going to be around my friends, my brothers, my disciples. And I'm going to use this time, every bit of it, to help teach and train. And during that time in which they're having that meal, what does Jesus do? Bends down, walks over, and washes the disciples' feet. His last night, and that's what he was doing. What an amazing display of selfless, sacrificial love. But that's Jesus' life. His whole life. He did that through his atoning death. Even, even his death on the cross. If you think about what he did on that cross, y'all remember he's hung between two thieves, right? And you got them just burying Jesus, mocking Jesus, all this stuff. And then one of them has a, maybe a little change of heart and says, hey, remember me when you're in your kingdom. Jesus provides words of encouragement to that thief on the cross. 
He says, truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. He was feeling every bit of that pain. He was thinking of others. And it wasn't just there too. When he looked over at his mom and he saw his mom and he saw John, he was hanging on that cross. In the Gospel of John, this is what it says. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to his disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Even to the last breath, Jesus was thinking of us. He was sacrificially, selflessly demonstrating his love for us. But the Corinthian church, they were so far amiss, they forgot the love aspect of even their fellowship meals. Well, as long as I'm in church and I love each other when we walk in, I smile and I give everybody a hug. I'm good. Yeah, it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing. All right, verse 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Well, that doesn't sound good at all, does it? Y'all know we're taking communion today, right? Oh, Ashley, you need to unpack that text. Hmm. What does Paul mean when he says you shouldn't take communion in an unworthy manner? What are we supposed to do when we examine ourselves? Because he tells us to do that too. Let me start with what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that if you've ever said in your entire life that you can't partake of communion. It doesn't mean that if you're in a situation of emotions, a difficulty, a struggle, uh, maybe you don't even feel like partaking of communion, that you can't partake of communion. You don't have to have that right. It's got to have the perfect attitude, and then I can partake of communion. Nope. The Lord invites us to the table. He's not trying to create ways to keep us from eating. This is a family meal. It's a family meal, and he's brought his, he's invited his children, and we get to eat with him. So he's not trying to keep you away from, from doing that. Now, what it does mean is this. In partaking of the Lord's Supper, we are proclaiming and identifying with Christ, which is why it doesn't make sense for non-believers to partake of communion. What are they remembering? What are they doing? It doesn't make sense. It also makes sense of, of why a person's first communion after receiving Christ is so special. So if we're not living a life that identifies with Christ, if we are not living a life that is consistent with us calling Jesus as Lord, then we need to repent. We need to come to the table with clean and real intentions. It means that as we're coming to the table, truly remembering the sacrifice that Christ made for us, and we're not partaking in a distracted manner. We're not partaking in a, in a ritualistic way without any thought to the symbols behind the communion. Some of the Corinthian Christians were selflessly treating the agape meal as a drunk fest with an unlimited buffet, and they were not demonstrating unity and love and, and sacrificial giving towards the body. So they were partaking of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. All right, when it comes to examining ourselves, Warren Wiersbe writes that there are four ways in which we should be doing this. First, we should look back. We should remember that Christ made this sacrifice for us. We should remember his death. It's not just some fictitious story, because it's not. It's truth. It's historical truth. It is the substance of our faith, and it is, it's a reality that shapes our eternal uh, life as Christians. Second, we are to look ahead. Is Christ still on the cross? Nope. Is he in some tomb somewhere with a rock in front of it? Nope. Hallelujah. He lives, right? He defeated death. He, he defeated the grave. Death, where art thou sting? And there's no sting. He defeated death. He is now sitting at the right hand of the Father. But here's the deal. There's going to come a day, and we don't know when, when he's going to return for us as Christians. 
And that way, that day, he's going to take us to where we can be where he is. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. So we are to look ahead as well. Third, we're to look within. We're to examine our own lives for sin and selfishness. We're to confess our sins and truly repent of them. That's when most people go, I got that one. And finally, we're to look around. Paul says we are told, or he says that we are to discern the Lord's body. There's a dual meaning here, right? We discern the Lord's body as in we look at the symbol of the bread and understand it's just a symbol. It's not the real deal. This symbol represents the blood or the body that, that was broken for me. We're to discern the bread or discern the body, but we're also to discern the body. That's us. That's the family of God. Now, that's not looking at your folks at the, on the different sides of you and pointing to, to them and going, I know what you did. It's not criticizing them for their, for their life. It's not pointing out their sins. It's a time of discerning our role within the body. Is there unity with us and other members in the fellowship? Are we caring for the body like we're supposed to? Are we loving one another like we should? In 1 John 4, it's written, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Mm. And just so we're clear, as Paul was going through this and he speaks of judgment in our text, I want you to understand he's not talking about losing your salvation. He's speaking of discipline. We know the Lord disciplines us when we're off track, and that's a good thing because it'll bring us back on track, right? If we allow the Lord to, to, to uh, speak to our hearts, our spirits, uh, speak to us. Paul says because some of the church, the folks that are in the church in Corinth, were not examining themselves before partaking of the Lord's Supper, the results are evident. People were getting sick and dying. But if we judge ourselves, if we truly examine ourselves and repent before partaking of communion, there's no need to fear that judgment. By disciplining us, the Lord lovingly keeps us from walking away from our faith entirely and being condemned to the final judgment. So we'll close out this chapter with these last couple of verses. I'll take a quick swig of water here. Yes, it is water. Yes, I know. Vodka's smellless. <laughs> All right, so verse 33. He says, So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone's hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. Paul's putting a cherry on the top, providing a summation of his instructions. When you come together for the agape meals, don't trample people to be first in line. Don't take your dishes to your table to only share with you and your friends. Wait for one another. These are good words, aren't they? Amen. Have you ever seen some fellowship meals in some churches? When all the chicken is gone. <laughs> You're going through the line, and you see this poor, but you see the looks on the faces, man. They're coming back with this little tiny wing, you know, maybe some gristle. <laughs> and they come and sit down, and everybody's sitting down, because all the chicken's gone, you got your plate, and you just thank you, Lord, for what I do have, right? But then what happens? The heavens open up. The angels start to sing, oh, and somebody comes out of the kitchen with this big old container full of hot, out of the oven, fried chicken. That'd be Angelina. That'd be Angelina. All right, fair enough. <laughs> Little angel. Yeah, that's right, Angelina. So what happens when everybody sees that there's more fried chicken that's available? Pam hit it right on the money. People start to speed walk up to that thing, right? <laughs> a bunch of Chris, it's almost, you know, like, again, like I said last week, like, Lord's handing out spiritual gifts. Come on down, right? Let's get in first in line. People are speed walking, and of course, as Christians, we're bumping into each other, but what we're, we're going to say, oh, excuse me, please, after you. <laughs> Not far after you, but please, go ahead. <laughs> it's crazy, but Paul says, if you're starving, eat at home. And then come to the meal. Maybe that way you can come and sit down and let others eat, but still share in the fellowship and the unity without trying to trample people to get some chicken. It's better that they eat at home and be filled so that they can still have fellowship and contribute to the unity of the church than to demonstrate selfishness by trying to fill their plates at the expense of others. 
Now, when Paul speaks of the other things, he will give directions about when he comes in verse 34. We're not sure exactly what he's speaking about specifically here. Uh, maybe he, he spoke to them, we just don't have it recorded. Maybe he changed his mind, and some of what we have in the rest of the chapter is some things that Paul, he said, you know, I don't know when I'm going to get there, so let me go ahead and write them down now. Or whatever it is, but it's not going to make a difference here because we have what the Lord has us to have. Amen? Amen. All right, saints, we finished off the 11th chapter. Yay. Yeah, I hope everyone can see how Paul is referring, referring to order and not chaos here. How there was an order to things, a way to do things properly, and yes, even in the Lord's Supper. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, I thank you for your holy word, and Father, I thank you for the gift of laughter and love. Lord, I thank you for your, for your word that just reminds us of, of how important love is, how important unity is, how that we're not just isolated, that we are to be together and use our gifts and talents and love uh, for one another. Father, I thank you so much for this body, this fellowship, and all churches. Lord, I just pray that you just put it in our minds that um, you've called us to be part of this. Father, we're all together one body. So, Father, I pray that um, you remind us to use our skills, our talents, our gifts, to encourage one another, to maintain the unity in the body, and to just bring you glory and honor in all things that we do. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, can anyone else see why I was feeling convicted? about the whole Lord's Supper thing and partaking of the Lord's Supper. I mean, did y'all feel some of that misery with me? I mean, there's nothing wrong with the way that we're doing communion. There's not. And it's done this way probably most churches in the same same fashion. And everybody comes down, they get their stuff, and then they do their thing. But I think we can do better. I think we can provide some opportunities for folks to have some fellowship and provide that unity. So here's what I propose. This is what I would like for us to do this morning. We're going to partake of communion in a minute. But what I want us to do is to take a few minutes. And um, those that are around you, I want you to talk with them. How are you doing? Social distancing still, but talk with them. Ask them what's going on in their lives. Get to know them. Hey, if you want to pray for them right then and there, you do it. You don't have to. Maybe you just take some of those, those prayer requests home with you and pray for the rest of this week. But this is part of what we should be doing when we're partaking of communion, right? It's important to remember what the Lord did. But if we look at how they did it in the early church, not that we're supposed to do everything they did, but what a beautiful symbol of unity within the body. So let's do that. So take a moment where you are, talk to the folks around you. Again, social distancing. Um, but just get to doing them, okay? Let's get up on our feet and let's let's do that.
everybody. I'm glad y'all got a chance to walk around maybe a little bit before we partook. Um, God, this thing is killing me. I just need to have it like right in front of me. Like one of those GoPros that we don't have to worry about anymore. I don't know where that thing is. Um, so I think this is just an important part and this is something we're going to continue to do going forward. Once this crazy COVID stuff is over um, and we can get together, I'd love to have the communion as part of a meal. You know, we all come together, we eat of a meal together, and at the end, we just do exactly this. But after the meal is done, or part of the, halfway through the meal maybe, we spend time getting to know each other and talking to each other in between the meal and desserts, because you know you've got to have desserts, right? <laughs> so, all right, so what I want to do is give you one more minute and what I want to do is, where you are, we've got the fellowship piece to it. I want you to spend some time as, as we talk about examining yourself, examining your role in the body, remembering what Christ did for you. Because what he did, I mean, truly sacrificial. When, when Jesus was on that cross, it's not like he had some sort of, um, I don't know, numbing device. He felt all that pain. He felt the pain of being beaten. He felt the, the ripping of his flesh on his back as those lashes hit him. He felt the, the, the spikes going through his hands and his feet. He felt the emotional turmoil and the pain of being abandoned and rejected. He felt it all, and he took it all for us. So just take a moment where you are and just maybe thank him. Remember what he did. See if there's anything we need to get ourselves right with. Repent. All right, just take your moment, please. Thank you, Jesus, so much for what you did for us. Something we can never repay. Now maybe we can just simply demonstrate our gratefulness by living a life according to your word and your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On that night that Jesus was to be betrayed, he took the bread. And he blessed it, he broke it, and he passed it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
After supper, Jesus took the cup in the same manner. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. What we're going to do now is we're going to continue on that whole idea, that concept of being one together. And we're going to sing a song. And um, some of you may remember this song, but some of you may not. But it's really short and easy to sing. But it's just a way of binding us together as one in unity. And after we sing the song, or as we're singing the song, whatever the case may be, if anyone needs just some time of prayer, um, just talk with me or... or you know, you want to accept Jesus as Lord. Maybe you haven't been doing that. Your life has not been the kind of life that maybe you know that Jesus expects from us. Look, it's not too late. Jesus loves you. And it's never too late. He'll welcome his arms openly to you and say, come on back. Maybe you've gone a little far astray. You want to recommit your life. Or maybe for some here, you've never accepted Jesus as Lord. And you want to make that decision today. What an amazing decision. Amen. There's only one way to salvation. And that's through Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. There's only one way. But as I've shared with you before, we have to understand this. <coughs> the life as a Christian is not an easy one. It's going to get more difficult in terms of persecution as time progresses. Our time here on this earth is short. I don't think there's anyone in... Ask someone 10 years ago if to look into the future and see what we're seeing today with the evil and the grossness and the division and the riots and the looting and all these things that are happening. And, and you tell them that's what's going to happen in 10 years. There's no way they'd go, ooh, Jesus is still a long ways away. We're closer than we've ever been. And we're getting closer and closer to his return. Are you ready? Are you ready? Jesus promised it will never leave you nor forsake you. Not that you won't go through difficulties. He didn't pray that they take us out of the world. Instead, we are to be the salt and the light. We're to be here in this world so that we can purvey hope and encouragement to others. That's why we're here. To worship Him, to serve Him in any capacity. So anybody, if that rings to your heart, the Holy Spirit's maybe speaking to you, stand up for Christ. Come and, and talk to me. I would love... I love talking about Jesus. He's my favorite subject. So give me an opportunity. But let's stand and sing our last uh, song today. Blessed be the... What is it? Blessed be the tie. <laughs> blessed be the name of the... No, blessed be the tie.
Stay clean, stay healthy, stay safe. Pray for each other, love on each other. Have a great week.